Chapter 18 Colonel Grangerford was a gentleman, you see. He was a gentleman all over. And so was his family. He was well born, as the saying is. And that's worth as much in a man as it is in a horse. So would Douglas said. And nobody ever denied that she was one of the first aristocracy in our town. And Papoy said it too. Though he weren't no more quality than Mudcat himself. Colonel Grangerford was very tall and very slim and had a darkish pally complexion. Not a sign of red in it anywhere. He was clean-shaved every morning all over his thin face, and he had some of the thinnest kind of lips, and the thinnest kind of nostrils, and a high nose, and heavy, che uh, heavy eyebrows, and the blackest kind of eyes, sunk so deep that they seemed like they was looking out of caverns at you, as you might say. His forehead was high, and his hair was gray and straight, and hung to his shoulders. His hands was long and thin, and every day of his life he put on a clean shirt, and had a full suit from head to foot, made out of linen so white it hurt your eyes to look at it. And on Sundays, he wore a blue tailcoat with brass buttons on it. He carried a mahogany cane with a silver head to it. There weren't no frivolousness about him, not a bit, and he weren't ever loud. He was as kind as could be. You could feel that, you know. And so you had confidence. Sometimes he smiled, and it was good to see. But when he straightened himself up like a liberty pole, the lightning began to flicker out from underneath his eyebrows. You wanted to climb a tree first and find out what was the matter afterwards. He didn't ever have to tell nobody to mind their manners. Everybody's always good mannered where it was him. Everyone loved to have him around, too. He was sunshine, most always. And I mean, he made it seem like good weather. When he turned into a cloud bank, it was awful dark for half a minute. And that was enough. There weren't nothing that could go wrong again for a week. When him and the old lady come down in the morning, all the family got up out of their chairs and give them good day, and didn't sit down again till they had sat down. Then Tom and Bob went over to the sideboard where the decanter was and mixed a glass of bitters and handed it to him. And he held it in his hand and waited till Tom's and Tom's and Bob's was mixed. And then they bobbed about and said, Our duty to you, sir and madam. And they bowed, the least bit of the world, said thank you. And so they drank, all three, Bob and Tom. And Bob and Tom poured a spoonful of water on the sugar and the mite of whiskey or apple brandy in the bottom of their tumblers. And they gave it to Buck and to me. And we drank with the old people, too. Bob was the oldest and Tom next. Tall, beautiful men with very broad shoulders and brown faces. And a long black hair and black eyes. And I'll have to get that message in a minute, because right now I'm reading about Tom Sawyer. I ain't reading about no Tom Sawyer. I'm reading about Huck Finn. That's how confused I get when I get a message in the middle of my reading. Where was I? Bob was the oldest, and Tom was next. Tall, beautiful men with very broad shoulders and brown faces and long black hair and black eyes. And they dressed in white linen from head to foot, like the old gentleman, and wore broad Panama hats. I'm betting I'm going to get that message any time again now. But in the meantime, there was Miss Charlotte. She was 25, and tall and proud and grand, but as good as she could be when she weren't stirred up. But when she had, but when she was, wow, there's a sentence in there somewhere. But when she was had, but when she was, she was, but when she was, she had a look that would make you wilt in your tracks like her father. That's when she was stirred up, I imagine. She was beautiful. So was her sister, Miss Sophia but in a different kind. She was gentle and sweet, like a dove, and she was only twenty. <sighs> Each person had their own nigger to wait on him. Buck, too. My nigger had a monstrous easy time, because I weren't ever used to have anybody do anything for me. But Buck's was on the jump most of the time. There it is again, that word. I don't like saying it, I don't like thinking about it. But it's in there. This was all there was of the family now, but there used to be more. Three sons, they got killed. 
and Emmeline that died. The old gentleman owned a lot of farms and over a hundred niggers. Sometimes a stack of people would come there, horseback, from ten to fifteen mile around and stay five or six days and have such junketings around and about and on the river and the dances and picnics and the woods in the daytimes and balls at the house at night. And these people was mostly kinfolk of the family. The men had brought their guns with them. And that was a handsome lot of quality, I tell you. There was another clan of aristocracy around here, five or six families, mostly of the name of Shepherdson. But they was all high-toned and well-born and rich and as grand as the Grangerfords. And the Shepherdsons and the Grangerfords used the same steamboat landing, which was about two mile above our house. So sometimes when I went up there with a lot of our folks, I used to see a lot of the Shepherdsons on their fine horses. One day, Buck and me was away out in the woods hunting, we heard a horse coming. We was crossing the road, and Buck says, Quick! Jump for the woods! Well, we done it. And then we peeped down the woods through the leaves. Pretty soon, a splendid young man came a-galloping. He was galloping down the road, setting his horse easy, and looking like a soldier. He had a gun across his pommel. I had seen him before. He was young Harney Shepherdson. I heard Buck's gun go off at my ear, and Harney's hat tumbled off of his head, he grabbed his gun and rode straight to the place where we was hid. But we didn't wait. We started through the woods on a run. The woods weren't th thick. So I looked over my shoulder to dodge the bullet, and twice I seen Harney cover Buck with his gun. And then he rolled away, rode away the way he come. To get his hat, I reckon, but I couldn't see. We never stopped running till we got home. The old gentleman's eyes blazed a minute. It was pleasure mainly, I judged. Then his face sort of smoothed down, and he says, kind of gentle, Now, I don't like you shooting from behind a bush. Why didn't you step into the road, my boy? Well, the Shepherdsons don't, Father. They always take advantage. Miss Charlotte, she held up her head like a queen while Buck was telling his tale, and her nostrils spread and her eyes snapped. The two young men looked dark, but never said nothing. Miss Sophia, she turned pale. But the color come back when she found the man wasn't hurt. As soon as I could get Buck down by the corn cribs under the trees by ourselves, I said, Did you want to kill him, Buck? Well, I bet I did. Well, what did he do to you? Him? He ain't never done nothing to me. Well, then, what did you want to kill him for? Why, nothing. Only it's kind of the feud. What's a feud? Why, where was you raised? Don't you know what a feud is? Well, I never heard of it before. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is, is this way. A man has a quarter with a mutter man and kills him. And then that other man's brother kills him. And the other brothers on both sides goes for one another. And then the cousins chip in. And by and by, everybody's killed off. And then there ain't no more feud. But it's kind of slow. It takes a long time. Well, told you. I told you there would be at their message. And there it was. But now Huck, he wants to know. Has this been going on long, Buck? Well, I should reckon. It started 30 years ago. Or somewhere's around long, long there. There was trouble about something. And then a lawsuit to settle it. And the suit went again on, again on one of them. And so he held up and shot the man that won the suit which he would naturally do, of course. Anybody would. Well, what was the trouble about, Buck? Land? I reckon, maybe. I don't know. Well, who done the shooting? Was it a Grangerford? A Shepherdson? Laws, how do I know? It was a long time ago. Don't anybody know? Oh, yeah, Pa knows, I reckon. And some of the other old folk know. But they don't know how what the right now what the row was about in the first place. Has there been many killed, Buck? Yeah, right. Smart chance of funerals, but that always kill. Pa's got a few buckshots in him, but he don't mind it because he don't win much anyway. Bob's been carved up some with a buoy. Tom's been hurt once or twice. Has anybody been killed this year, Buck? 
Yes. We got one. They got one. About three months ago, my cousin Bud, 14 years old, was riding through the woods on the other side of the river and didn't have no weapon with him, which is playing foolishness in a lonesome place. And in a lonesome place, he hears a horse coming up on him and sees old Baldy Shepperson on Lincoln after him with his gun in his hands and his white beard flying in the wind. Instead of jumping off and taking to the bush, Buck Lode, he could outrun him. So they had at it, nip and tuck, for four or five miles or more. The old man had gained it all the time. So at last, but said, but, but, Bud said, seeing it weren't no use. So he stopped and faced around so as to have the bullet holes in front. You know. And the old man, he rode up and shot him down. But he didn't get a chance to enjoy it for much of his luck. For inside of a week, our folk laid him out. I reckon that old man was a coward, Buck. I reckon he weren't a coward, not by blame sight. There ain't a coward amongst them Shepherdsons, not a one. And there ain't no cowards amongst the Grangerfords, neither. Why, that old man kept up his end of the fight for one and a half days and hours against three of those Jefferson Grangerfords, not Jeffersons, ain't no Jeffersons at all in this county. And he come out the winner. And they was all a horseback. He lit off on his horse and got behind a little wood pile and kept his horse before him to stop the bullets. But the Grangerfords, they stayed on their horses and capered around the old man and peppered at, away at him. And he peppered away at them. Him and his horse both went home pretty leaky and crippled. But the Grangerfords had to be fetched home. And one of them was dead. Another died the next day. No, sir. If a body's out hunting for cowards, he don't want to fool away time amongst them Shepherdsons. Because they don't breed any of that kind. Well, next Sunday, we all went to church about three miles. Everybody a horseback. The men took their guns along, so did Buck, and kept them between their knees or stood them handy against the wall. And the Shepherdsons, they done the same. It was pretty ornery preaching. All about brotherly love and such like and tiresomeness. And everybody said it was a good sermon. And they all talked it over going home. And had such a powerful lot to say about faith and the good works and free grace and predestination and I don't know what all. That it did seem to me to be one of the roughest Sundays I'd ever come across yet. About an hour after dinner, everybody was dozing around, some in their chairs and some in their rooms. And it got to be pretty dull. Buck and a do dog was stretched out on the grass and the sun sound asleep, and I went up to our room. I judged I would take a nap myself. And I found that sweet Sophia standing in her door, which was next to ours. And she took me in her room and shut the door very soft, and asked if I liked her. And I said I did. And she asked me if I would do something for her and not tell anybody. And so I said I would. Then she said she'd forgot her testament and left it in the seat at the church between two other books. And would I slip out quiet and go there and fetch it to her and not say nothing to nobody? Well, I said I would. So I slid out and slipped off up the road, and there weren't nobody up at the church, except maybe a hog or two, for there weren't any lock on the door, and the hogs like a punching floor in the summertime because it's cool. If you know, notice, most folks don't go to church only when they got to. But a hog, hog is different. I says to myself, something's up. It ain't natural for a girl to be in such a sweat about a testament. So I give it a shake. And out drops a little piece of paper with half past two wrote on it with a pencil. Well, I ransacked it, but I couldn't find nothing else. I couldn't make nothing out of that. So I put the paper in the book again, and when I got home and upstairs... There was Miss Sophia in her doorway, waiting for me. She pulled me in and shut the door, and then looked in the testament till she found the paper. And as soon as she read it, she looked glad. And before a body could think, she grabbed me and gave me a squeeze, and said I was the best boy in the world and not to tell anybody. She was mighty red in the face for a minute, and then her eyes lighted up, and it made her powerful pretty. But I was a good deal astonished. But when I got my breath, I asked her what the paper was about. And she asked me if I had read it, and I said no. And she asked me if I could read writing. And I told her, no, only coarse hand. 
And then she said the paper wasn't anything but a bookmark to keep her place. Then I might go and play now. Well, I went off down to the river, studying over the thing. And pretty soon I noticed that my nigger was falling along behind. And when we was out of the side of the house, he looked back and around a second, and then comes a running and says, Mars George, if you'll come down to the swamp, I'll show you a whole stack of water mo moccasins. Thinks I, well, that's mighty curious. He said that yesterday. He ought to know a body don't love moder a body don't love moder a body don't love water moccasins enough to go hunting for him. What's he up to anyway? So I says, all right, you trot ahead. So I followed for about a half a mile, and then he struck out out over the swamp, and waited ankle deep for as much as another half mile. We come to a little flat piece of land, which was dry and very thick with trees and vines and, and, and bushes, and see, he says, if you, shy, if you shove right in there, just a few step, steps, Master George, there's what they is. I seen them before. I don't care to see them no more. And then he slopped right along and went away. And pretty soon the trees hit him. And I poked into the place a ways and come to a little open patch, as big as a bedroom, all hung around with vines. And I found a man laying there asleep. And by jings, it was my old Jim. Well, I waked him up, and I reckoned it was going to be a grand surprise to him see me again. But it weren't. He nearly cried he was so glad. But he weren't surprised. He said he swum along behind me that night and heard me yell every time. But he dasn't answer because he didn't want nobody to pick him up and take him into slavery again. Says he, I got hurt a little and I couldn't swim as fast so I was considering the ways, a considerable ways behind you toward the last. And when you landed, I reckon I could catch up with you and didn't land about having to shout at you. But when I see that house, I begin to go slow. I was, I was too far off to hear what they say to you, but I was afraid of the dogs. And then when it was all quiet again, I knowed you was in the house. So I struck out for the woods to wait for day. And then early in the morning, some of the niggers came along, going to the fields. And they took me in and showed me this place. What the dogs can't track me on accounts of the water. And it brings me truck to eat every day and every night. And it tells me how you's a getting along. Why didn't you tell my Jack to fetch me here sooner, Jim? Well, Torno used to disturb you, Huck. Till we could do something. But he's all right now. I've been buying the pots and pans and the vittles as I got a chance and patching up the raft nights when... What raft, Jim? Well, our old raft. You mean to say our old raft wasn't smashed all the flinders? No, she weren't. She was tore up a good deal. One end of her was. But there ain't no great harm to her. Only your, your traps was most all louse. If we hadn't dived so deep and swum so fur under, and the night hadn't have been so dark, and we weren't so scared, and been such pumpkin heads, as the saying is, we'd have seen the raft. But it's just as well because we didn't, because now she's all fixed up again and most good as new. And we got to get a lot of new stuff in place of what we lost. Well, how did you get a hold of the raft again, Jim? Did you catch her? How am I going to catch her when I'm in the woods? No. Some of the niggers found her and catched her up in long slide, along here in the, in the snags. And they hid her in a creek amongst the wills. And they was so much John about which of them it belonged to that, they most, that I most come to hear about it. And pretty soon I ups and settles the whole trouble by telling them she don't belong to none of them. But she belonged to you and me. And asked him if they was going to grab, grab a young white gentleman's property and get hidden for it. And then I gave him ten cents apiece. And they was mighty well satisfied with that. And which some more wafts would, would come along and they make them rich again. 
that has been mighty good to me, them niggers. And whatever I want for him to do for me, I don't have to ask twice. That Jack's a good nigger. And pretty smart. Yeah, he is. He ain't ever told me you was here. He told me to come, and he'd show me a lot of water moccasins. And if anything happens, he ain't hooked up in it. He can say he never seen us together, and it'll be the truth. I don't want to talk much about the next day. I reckon I'll just cut it pretty short. I waked up about dawn, was going to turn over and go back to sleep when I noticed how still it was. Didn't seem to be anybody stirring. Well, that wasn't usual. Next, I noticed Book, Buck was up and gone. Well, I gets up and I'm wondering and goes downstairs, nobody around, everything just as still as a mouse, just the same outside. And thinks I, what's this mean? Down by the woodpile comes across my jack, and he sa and, and I says, What's this all about? Says he, Don't you know, Master George? No, says I, I don't. Well, then, Miss Sophia's run off. Deed she has. She run off in the night sometime. Nobody don't know just when. Run off to get married to that young Harney Shepherdson. You know, at least so they expect family found out about it about half an hour ago, maybe a little more. And I tell you, there weren't no time lost. Sitch another hurrying up and guns and horses you never saw. And the woman folks has gone to stir up the relations, and the old Mars saw, and the boys tucked their guns and rode off up the river road to try to catch that young man and kill him before he get across the river with Miss Sophie. I reckon there's going to be mighty rough times. Buck went off without waking me up. Well, I reckon he did. They weren't going to mix you up in it. Mess Buck, he loaded up his gun and load. He's going to fetch home a Shepherdson or bust. Well, there'll be plenty of them. I reckon, and you bet he'll fetch one on, one on, before he gets a chance. Or they'll get him. I took up the river road as hard as I could put, and by and by I began to hear guns a good way off. When I came in sight of the log store and the woodpile where the steamboats lands, I worked along under the trees and the brush till I got a good space, and then I clumb up to the forks of a cottonwood that was out of reach and watched. There was a wood rank four foot high a little ways in front of the tree, and the first I was going to do was hide behind that, but maybe you're luckier I didn't. There were four or five men cavorting around on their horses in the open place before the log store, cussing and yelling, and trying to get at a couple of good young chaps that was behind the wood rank, all along one side with the steamboat landing, but they couldn't come it. Every time one of them showed himself on the riverside of the woodpile, he got shot at, and the two boys were squatting back to back behind the pile so they could watch both ways. By and by, the men stopped cavorting around and yelling. They started riding towards the store. Then up and gets one of the boys and draws a steady beat over the wood rank and drops one of them out of his saddle. All the men jumped up off the horses and grabbed the hurt one to start to carry him to the store. And that minute, the two boys started on the run. Well, they got halfway to the tree I was in before the men noticed. And then the men see him and jumped on their horses and took out after them. They gained on the boys, but it didn't do no good. The boys had too good a start. They got to the wood pile that was in front of my tree and slipped in behind it. So they had the bulge on the men again. One of the boys was Buck. The other was a slim young chap, about 19 years old. The men ripped around a while, and then rode away. As soon as they was out of sight, I sung out to Buck and told him. He didn't know what to make of my voice coming out of the tree at first. He was awful surprised. He told me to watch out sharp and let him know when the men come in sight again. He said they was going to go up to Devilman, one way or the other. Wouldn't be long gone. Why, well, I wished I was out of that tree. My dad had come down. Buck began to cry and rip, and loathed that him and his cousin Joe, that was the other young chap, would make up for this day yet. He said his father and two brothers was killed. 
two or three of the enemy. He said the Shepherdsons laid for them in ambush. Buck said his father and brothers ought to be waited, waited for their relationships. The Shepherdsons was too strong for them. I asked him what was to become a young Miss Young Harney and Miss Sophia. He said they'd got across the river and was safe. I was glad about that. But the way Buck did take on because he didn't manage to kill Harney that day he shot at him, I never heard nothing like it. All of a sudden, bang, 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 goes three or four guns. The men had slipped around through the woods and come in from behind without their horses. The boys jumped for the river. Both of them got hurt. And as they swum down the current, the men run along the bank shooting at them, singing, Kill them! Kill them! Kill them! Made me so sick I almost fell out the tree. I ain't gonna tell all that happened. It'd make me sick again if I was to do that. I wished I had never come ashore that night to see such things. I ain't ever going to get shut of them. Lots of times, even now, I dream about them. Well, I stayed in the tree until it began to get bar dark. I was afraid to come down. Sometimes I heard guns away off in the woods, and twice I seen little gangs of men gallop past the log store with guns. So I reckon the trouble was still going on. I was mighty downhearted. So I made up my mind I wouldn't ever go near that house again. Because I reckon I was to blame, somehow. I judged that that piece of paper meant that Miss Sophie was to meet Harney somewhere half past two and run off. And I judged I ought to told her father about that paper and the curious way she acted. And then maybe he'd have locked her up. And this awful mess wouldn't have ever have happened. When I got down from the tree, I crept along down the river bank a piece and found the two bodies laying at the edge of the water and tugged at them till I got them ashore. Then I covered up their faces and got away as quick as I could. I cried a little when I was covering up Buck's face. He was mighty good to me. It was just dark now. I never went near the house, but struck through the woods and made way for the swamp. Jim weren't on his island. So I tramped off in a hurry for the creek, crowded through the willows, red hot to jump aboard and get a, out of that awful country. And the raft was gone. My souls, but I was scared. I couldn't get my breath for most a minute. Then I raised a yell. A voice not twenty foot from me says, Good land! Is that you, honey? Don't make so noise! It was Jim's voice. Nothing ever sounded so good before. I run along the bank a piece and got aboard. And Jim, he grabbed me and hugged me. He was so glad to see me. Laws, bless you, child. I was right down sure. You's dead again. Jack's been here. He said he reckoned you'd been shot. Because you didn't come home no more. So I was just this minute of starting to start the raft down toward the mouth of the, of the creek. So as to be all ready to shove out and leave as soon as Jack comes again and tells me for certain you is dead. Lawsy, I'm mighty glad to get you back again, honey. And I says, All right, that's mighty good. They won't find me, and they'll think I've been killed and floated down the river. There's something up there that'll, uh, that, that'll help them think so. So just don't lose no more time, Jim. But just shove off for the big river as fast as big water, as fast as you can. Well, I never felt easy till the raft was two miles below there and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we hung up our signal lantern and we judged that we was free and safe once more. I hadn't a bite to eat since yesterday. So Jim, he got out some corn dodgers, and some buttermilk and pork and cabbage and greens. There ain't nothing in the world that's so good as when it's cooked right. And whilst I eat my supper, we talked and had a good time. I was powerful glad to get away from the feuds. And so was Jim to get away from the swamp. And we said there weren't no home like a raft, after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smotherly, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft.